So thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm trying to lay down some basic facts about India so you get a sense of what we're talking about in terms of how big the country is and uh, the enormity of the situation will sort of come to reveal itself as we go, go along. Um, we are supposed to be a socialist, secular, democratic republic. We have a population of 1.4 billion. We have 28 states and eight union territories. We speak uh, close to 500 languages, but including dialects that goes above 1,000. So uh, having a common language across an entire nation is almost impossible. We have a sex ratio of uh, 948 females for every 1,000 males. We have several social classifications uh, in the name of caste, religion, region. We, um, a large majority of Indian population lives in the rural Indian. Popul is the rural Indian population, so we have about 72 to 28 rural to urban ratio. So uh, when I said castes, we also have a lot of sub-castes and sub-sub-castes and all kinds of different ways in which people try to distinguish themselves from, oh, we're not them, we are them. You know, so many different ways in which people go about it. Um, and as for the legal system, it's much like over here in Britain, not here, but in the UK where you have an adversarial model where um, say I experience something and I go to the court, I'm immediately removed from all processes because it becomes the state versus the perpetrator. So somebody did some harm to me, I'm immediately removed from the system. It's uh, say in my state Tamil Nadu, person X versus state of Tamil Nadu. And in terms of um, with the victim being female, there's a loss of um, voice of this female um, that's missing in the whole investigation or in the whole jurisprudence process itself. She's immediately removed. So the way I've designed this talk is I thought I'll go over uh, in, in partial detail um, about several ways in which males oppress females. We we'll start off with the absolute beginning. Uh, when a child is born, uh, if it is female, we kill it. We kill the baby in vitro, we kill the baby after she's born. Horrifyingly, there's a village in the northern part of India where for about 10 years, there was no recorded female child. It's not that she wasn't born, it's just that she didn't survive or she wasn't recorded, the family didn't bother. So imagine an entire decade of just male children flourishing in that village. Um, in, um, the sex selection of uh, the child where you go to the hospital and find out the sex of the baby is illegal in India for this reason. And yet that happens to an extent that there are folk songs that these old women sing in villages where you go and take the child. There are these songs they sing and feed poison to the child and then they kill the child, the female child only. So that's uh, infanticide and feticide for you. Um, most neglected conversation around uh, male violence against women is the suicide of females, I think, because we, we talk about domestic violence, we talk about all kinds of other abuse which is directly perpetrated by the males, but what we don't talk about is the violence that's perpetrated by female that push them towards killing themselves. We don't talk about that much, uh, but India reported the highest suicide rate in its history in 2021 with 12 suicides for every 100,000 people. Now, for a country like India, that's still a large number. We have 1.4 mil uh, billion, so that's quite a lot of number. And this is only the recorded information, so we don't know how many just go unrecorded. Um, yeah, and in 2021, this could be because of better reporting, but the actual number could be a lot higher. Uh, despite an increase in re uh, reporting, Indian Crime Report Bureau is undercounting suicides by women. The reason could be, for example, if there's domestic violence in a house, and it's a known thing in a, fam in, a, in a street, say, in a society. And if the woman kills herself, they try to make it as if it's some food poisoning or some such, because if it was indeed suicide, then the police would have to investigate what contributed to her suicide, which would then lead to investigation about domestic violence in the house. And the families don't want it, so they try and bury it. So a lot of suicides like that just get considered as some sort of a 
some sort of a medical issue or like a natural death or something like that. In 2021, a little more than a quarter of suicide victims were women. Um, of, of all the women that died by suicides, the most were housewives, followed by students. And during the COVID season, the COVID period of lockdown and uh, a significant population became what is called as ultra poor, which is below even than poor. Okay, and I think right now the number is somewhere around 400 million Indians who are under the poverty line. And there was a separate category, which was ultra poor, which was absolutely marginalized uh, category. Um, and a lot of such houses because of depravity, because of lack of access during the COVID lockdown, lack, loss of jobs and everything forced a lot of these people to suicide and the students being cooped up in the house, probably suffering from a lot of violence at home from say mother, uh, I don't know, father or neighbor, or friends and things like that, um, ended up just taking their own lives. It also so happens that um, more young women die by suicide than anywhere else in the world. More young women in India die by suicide than anywhere in the world. Uh, this was shocking to me too when I was making notes for this, um, it seems. There's a significant margin. There's 5.4 per 100,000 females elsewhere. We are 6.6 .6 per 100,000. So that's a giant leap in terms of rates of suicide. Um, this is significant in, con in conversations around male violence against women because the, Im though the impact isn't direct, it's not caused by male, but we all know what led up to her suicide and it most often is because of domestic violence and some form of coercive control or dowry violence and you know all kinds of different ways, sexual violence, all kinds of different ways in which a woman feels compelled uh, and helpless that she decides this is the best way for me. Okay, and there is obviously also, I mentioned ultra poor, there's a lot of malnutrition, there's poor access to healthcare, um, there's illiteracy because, like I said, a large population is rural. Access to education isn't one of their priorities. They're not bothered about sending their children to school right now because they're worried about putting food um, on plates that very night. So they're trying to figure out a way in which they can keep their family alive rather than educated. So. Because of illiteracy, a lot of new problems emerge, like their knowledge about the world, their knowledge about access to healthcare, where will they know what they need to do in case some family member falls sick? They most probably won't. So that then leads to a lot of complications for women of the household because if it is, a, say for example, a gynecological or a childbirth related issue or a contraception related issue, that something that could be averted so easily, but the family has no clue what to do. And therefore, the woman ends up dying for no reason. So we, like, a, like suicide, illiteracy is also a reason we somehow not take too seriously when we are talking about male violence against women. And in a society like India, sending a girl child to school is not seen as a priority. And that itself, I think, is male violence against women. Um, and you probably have heard about this phenomenon where they keep the girl child away when she's menstruating, called the period huts. This is also popular in Nepal and Bangladesh to a certain extent. Basically, this is just a very dilapidated, some makeshift corner uh, outside of the house because it is considered to be dirty or impure uh, to allow a girl, menstruating girl inside the house. So 90% of the time, it so happens that that place is very unkempt. Nobody really goes in there to clean it or make it comfortable for the girl. So if she's menstruating this month and however it is this month, it's gonna stay there after she finishes menstruating and she has to go back there in 30, 28 days, it's gonna look exactly like that. And in rural areas, far into the jungles and everything, there are known cases of snakes and other wild animals entering that little dilapidated hut because it's easy access and killing those girl children. This has happened several times and often goes unreported as well. Um, of course, you could argue that it's the women of the house that make the young girl children sit outside like that. It's a fair argument, but she is also driven by patriarchy that expects female, uh, that considers female impure at the time of menstruation. So it all adds up to the male violence category. Yeah. Um, and the chilling images of these girls just laying there 
um, sometimes without food and water have also been recorded where the family just forgot this girl was menstruating. You know, we're talking about, say, four or five days average. And if she's really young and she is illiterate, she doesn't understand what's going on with her body. Um, she needs all the nutrition and everything, and the family's probably poor, family's illiterate, so doesn't understand what needs she has during that time. So basically, due to neglect, the girl child that just passes away without food and water as well in, the, in those secluded huts. This it might be uh, interesting, but in 2022, India still punishes women for being a witches. Witchcraft uh, is considered to be one of those things which is uh, um, apparently exclusive to females. Females become witches and they cast spells on families that then brings them bad luck or you know things like that. Even today in rural Jharkhand, Orissa, uh, places like that, whoever the community thinks are witches are gathered in the city center and the village center and are beaten, beaten to death. And everybody watches and makes sure that those women are dead and then feel safe because the witches are gone. And what have these women done most of the time? It would just be nothing. The, so the, the neighborhood just like randomly decides that we don't like this woman. We're going to call her a witch. We're going to beat the hell out of her in the middle of the village. And there, problem solved. Sometimes these witches could even be underage girls for no reason. Recently, um, in I think 20... No, no, this month actually. This is uh, November, right? No, this is October. This is October. Yeah. All right, just in the past month, um, a couple killed two middle-aged women with the hope that their sacrifice, this also happens, it sacrifice females as well. If the woman is given away as a sacrifice, the family believed that it will give them some financial security. So they pick a random woman, kill her, give it away as sacrifice, thinking that once that is done, suddenly they're going to gain financial stability. And this is also sort of orchestrated by these really exploitative godmen who can uh, just really um, meet you at your worst and exploit your vulnerability or whatever it is that you're going through and then feed on it and then say, just catch hold of some random woman, give her away a sacrifice and you'll get financial independence. And let's just, obviously they're not gonna get financial independence. And let's say if they go back to the Godman and say, well, that hasn't worked now, what do we do? The Godman would just say, well, you didn't do it properly or let's just do another sacrifice to just mitigate the losses or mitigate the situation that we might have missed last time. Let's just go ahead and kill another woman. So that happens as well. This is often not uh, seen or taken really seriously because it's so rare and absurd. People hardly ever believe me when I say in 2022 there are women that are beaten up as witches. People hardly believe me and uh, you know, I'm here, I'm from India, I'm speaking English. I, I look privileged. Contrast that with some old woman in the middle of nowhere getting beaten up because she's a witch. This just does not add up. So when they see me speaking about this, they can't really comprehend a world that I'm trying to paint uh, in front of the audience. So they often just consider that to be like a one-off, but it happens a lot. Um, as you probably know, caste system is a big deal in India. Um, there's like a social hierarchical strata, just purely by chance of birth, uh, based on the caste that your parents belong to, you are born in it, you live in it, you die in it. Therefore, the privileges and the abuse that come with the caste that you're born and born with is going to stay with you forever. And so you can imagine as we keep going down the bottom of the pyramid, the ones that are the most oppressed caste bear the worst brunt. And in that, the women of those said uh, oppressed bottommost caste um, have it even worse. Um, there are all kinds of reasons in which uh, caste comes to play. You can't marry a woman who's from a lower caste. If you do, then that's tainting the family lineage. So the couple get beaten up and killed. That happens a lot. They call it honor killing. You're um, upholding the honor of the caste, of the superior caste, by eliminating these anomalies. How dare they um, 
fall in love and want to be with each other their whole life. We're going to eliminate this anomaly because we don't want that sort of a dirty thing in our lineage because our lineage is going to be pure and superior. And caste sort of comes to play in pretty much everything, your access to education, your access to jobs, everything, because assume, um, imagine this, where you're in a country and you're given, say, 10 different bags of things that you have access to and all those things you can use throughout your whole life. They probably not even have one bag. So they work hard, they, they, they try and study and then they gain some sort of a social capital and they manage to get two bags. But I've already earned a thousand. You know, and the rate at which they try to catch up is just always so slow that they end up not performing well. And then they end up being ostracized for being not performing well because of them being of a said caste. It's a vicious cycle. So you, you, you're born in a poor caste and, uh, sorry, um, oppressed caste and you're already hated. And as a society, we have deprived them of all those opportunities. And then now when they're trying to come up, we are again telling them, oh, you're from that caste. That's why you're not doing very well. Um, this is probably why this particular caste is best not educated at all. Go back to your, you know, whatever. And now picture this for the women of the said caste. Not only do they have to deal with the violence of men in their homes of their own caste, uh, th that violence that woman faces becomes horizontal as well as vertical. So she basically has to deal with abuse in every single caste, subcaste, all the, working all the way up to the most oppressed, uh, oppressing caste. So imagine somebody like a street hawker, somebody selling flowers by the road outside a temple. Any man can just walk up to her, flash at her, you know, masturbate at her. They can do anything. This woman will have absolutely no voice whatsoever. And even if she dares go to the police station or something like that to make a complaint, the police would do her, do her the same favor. It would, the custodial rape is, again, a very uh, important topic that nobody really talks about. A woman is um, kept in the police premises, the police station. There's an ongoing investigation. and. The police misbehave with her. There was a very, um, very prominent case about um, this particular wo uh, woman called Mathura, I think her name is. Um, it became such a crisis in the country, a lot of women's rights activists made a huge deal out of it that uh, the police need to be made accountable. Um, and I think that is when they did something very, very perverse, like they tried to test whether she was indeed raped. And, you know, this really horrible two-finger test, as they call it, they did that. And they said that she's wet. She probably wanted it. Therefore, this is probably not rape. You know, this is, are we talking about police, whom you go to when you're in distress or crisis? They're supposed to protect you, and yet they are the big biggest nightmare for women. So they came up with solutions like female-only police stations, but they are so entrenched in their patriarchal values that if a woman's bleeding out of her face, okay, the husband has pumped, just literally brutalized her, and you can see her bleeding, you go to an all-female cop, the woman would just say, you see, um, last week there was a case. The woman died. You must be grateful. Why don't you just go back and, you know, adjust and sort it out with him? It's uh, probably something that you did anyway. Um, just to try and find out what he needs. Just be, be um, subservient, be there for him, do what he says, then this won't happen to you. So they turned it around on her that she getting beat up by this drunk man is also her fault. And this is the police and a female police at that. So it has been overall uh, a very, um, like the, the criminal justice system in itself has been a pretty useless endeavor in our country. There are a lot of laws that are, in theory, fabulous. It's so fabulous that some of these laws that we have, that uh, activists have come together after years and years and years of advocacy, they come up with this on print. The, 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 the law exists. You take that law, you can template that in any other country, and if implemented properly, it's a great law. We have some of the great laws. Nobody in India follows it. 
especially the ones that are supposed to execute it, nobody follows it. There are judges who say to women, um, you're wearing sleeveless, you probably asked for it. You're not wearing a dupatta, you're not covering your breasts, you asked for it. I don't like your attitude, you asked for it. You exist, you asked for it. That's how the attitude has been towards uh, any woman that's facing some form of violence um, for, for any reason at all, domestic, student in college, you know, these jilted lovers who seek revenge if you don't return their, uh, return their love. Um, you go to the police station and the court and everybody, they just do not take it seriously enough that if he continues to pursue her and if she continues to say no, it's gonna turn out to be a really bad affair for her. Um, I'll give you an example about this whole stalking situation. I think personally, it's very important for me as well. Um, so this sort of surpasses all classes and castes. So we, we're talking about not just the rural women, now we're talking about women all over the country, including women like me. You have a situation where there are these men, any man in your street, from your college, they pursue you um, and the girl says no. It's never understood as no. Uh, no, apparently it's not a complete sentence, never a complete sentence in India. So they pursue, keep pursuing you. And when they realize that she's not going to say yes or not going to give in or succumb to his uh, advances, they resort to many things like pouring acid on her face. Like, I can't have you, nobody can. Or are you so arrogant that you think you're so beautiful that you'd refuse my advances? That throw acid at you, a lot of acid surviving, uh, acid attacks surviving women, a majority of them perpetrated by males. Recently, a girl uh, was in a railway station on the way to her college, and this guy who has been pursuing her for years now, and the woman has been relentlessly saying no, had a conversation, ongoing train, he just pushed her. She died on the spot. This happened this month. And um, about a year ago, she had in fact gone to the police station and said, this man's been stalking me. A year ago, he came out on bail immediately. And he's still been pursuing her even then. Now I think he's finally had enough of it. He pushed her against a moving train and that woman's just dead. She's pursuing uh, her undergraduate in college. She had her whole life ahead of her. It's over now. And this man's supposedly in jail being investigated and everybody knows it's not gonna amount to anything at all. And how do you punish this? I don't even think death is good enough. I'm not for, I'm not for life sentence, I'm sorry, I'm not for death sentences at all, but I'm just so angry the number of times men get away with things like this that I find no punishment would be grave enough uh, when you compare that with the death of that girl. And that girl is basically every girl in this country. Um, like anywhere else, during COVID, the rise in domestic violence cases happened in India as well. Mm -hmm. There were these helplines set up in, uh, I mean, it was COVID and everybody was affected. So having a helpline and having somebody uh, attend those calls was in itself a big deal because uh, it was a lockdown and everybody had to be in their home. So they, somehow the state put some mechanism together to have some sort of a helpline. Lines won't stop ringing. They set up a helpline hoping not many people would call and they hadn't had a plan in place in case women call. Not only did they not call, the lines got jammed and they never had a plan in place. They, were, they weren't going to go to the woman's house to sort things out for her or see if she's in distress, she's, in de she's dead. They weren't gonna go, go do that. But they didn't have any idea what they were gonna do when women call. That was the, and this is, this changes per state. We also have certain state uh, um, discretion in terms of how we approach certain topics. So it needn't necessarily be like one unified uh, central uh, law that all the states have to practice. So certain states were better than the others, you could say, but not to an extent that it was even close to um, what was needed. So the COVID cases, domestic violence, then led to uh, a lot of these suicides, which we earlier talked about. Okay, now we come to a very uh, horrible topic. You probably heard of marital rape. 
uh, in India, it's not illegal. Okay, get this. A man marries a woman, he rapes her, it's not illegal. However, man marries a woman who happens to be underage, then there will be some scrutiny. While he should have never married a minor in the first place. So it's a huge sort of an overlap of all sorts of horrible decisions, policy making that has turned marital rape into a, situ into a non issue. And I tell you with such confidence here that practically every woman in a marriage is being raped. Um, maybe not every night, but she has been raped while being married to a man. And she has absolutely no recourse whatsoever. Instead, what they did was came up with uh, campaigns to safeguard men's rights in India. They, because the marital rape cases were just so ongoing, similarly with the domestic violence and the dowry prohibition cases, so they came up with these laws that are at least to look at seemed like some access to recourse, right? It appeared to be something. I mean, you're not hitting a wall, hitting against a wall. There was something. But men's rights movement started this campaign where they created this huge ruckus about women um, filing fake cases. So the seriousness of marital rape or domestic violence or dowry became absolutely, amounted to absolutely nothing because everybody was suddenly worried, what if a man gets punished for rapes that he did not commit? Oh God, what do we do? You know, it's so grave. We can't let a man get arrested and punished for a rape that he didn't do. So we've got to be careful when women come to the, as it is, I told you in the beginning, the victim's immediately removed, right? The state investigates the perpetrator. The woman, most of the time, doesn't even get to tell her testimony, and even, even, if, they doubt, and even, if, even if she does, she's asked those really pressing, uncomfortable questions that she gives up halfway. She doesn't want to talk about it. She doesn't want to detail what happened to her. She shouldn't have to. And yet they make it so uncomfortable for the women that they just really don't care. And a large majority of women believe this is how life is. This is marriage, that your husband will want to have sex with you regardless of whether or not you want to have them. You want to have sex with them that night at all. They just go ahead and do it, and that's just how it has been for all women everywhere. And India is apparently one of the 36 countries where uh, marital rape has not been criminalized. So in some way, that's a silver lining. I guess we are not the only <laughs> horrible country in the world. There are several other countries like uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, no shock, not shocking at all. Egypt and Botswana, where men have actual legal right over their wife and have access to sex with their wife, and the wife can't do anything about it. Recently, however, when we're talking about um, um, cases where men rape you, they so marital rape is is not illegal. However, in circumstances of, say, domestic violence or something like that, or in, in terms of abortion, for example, if that rape resulted in pregnancy, there was a recent um, verdict. If a woman gets pregnant and she wants to abort it, but she's married, and it was a pregnancy that she did not want, under those circumstances, they might consider this to be a marital rape situation while it is still illegal. So you see there's like a tiny bit of glimmer there where the courts have seen some uh, merit in considering marital rape to be a problem, at least in terms of abortion rights. So there are now women who can seek access to abortion while still being married and say that I did not want this because my husband raped me and will be provided um, abortion. This is, this is like an ideal scenario, right? There are all kinds of other problems, like she goes to the hospital and they treat her like shit, they, they ask her all sorts of questions, they dissuade her from getting an abortion, all kinds of, that's, that's not even something that I'm going in detail about. But you can imagine that in, in itself, it's a big deal that a court thought that under certain circumstances, we would consider marital rape to be rape, therefore the woman can have access to abortion. While they're still speculating whether it will break the code of Indian family system if we go into people's bedrooms and, you know, 
dictate what's happening we shouldn't be able to we shouldn't we shouldn't do that it's just wrong you also have probably heard about um, medical negligence cases that happens to women um, you know we don't have a female default anywhere in the world definitely not in india so all medical practices are designed in a way that they are assumed to be of a male anatomy so a lot of these conditions um, caroline uh, Perez's book dictates, uh, sorry, e explains in great detail about the differences in a male and a female body, how certain access to medical uh, care should be very different from for a male, and how women, the symptoms of which women feel, uh, have just before they're going to get a cardiac arrest is vastly different from how a male um, feels before cardiac arrest. All those things have been de written in detail, and yet access to all this health care is very, very male based so we don't have any sex based medical research which would allow women to have access to healthcare that is unique to the female sex in a way that so many lives could be saved if only they looked at it that way it's it does not happen this again is one of those things which we might not consider to be under the purview of male violence against women but i consider this to be a huge problem as well because the policy makers are men after all and to have so much so many prestigious colleges and have all these students year after year graduating as doctors and you know specialists and everything and not it, it, it didn't dawn on anyone to have specialized research on the female anatomy sort of really boggles the mind even when it comes to pregnancy or menstruation or um, there's a conversation about how PMS is a big pre, pre uh, um, I forgot what it's called. Um, you're you're uh, ex going to experience menstruation, but you're having this mood swings just before this, and it seems it's it's so it's, um, it's so dangerous for some women that they tend to get suicidal. It's so bad for them emotionally. The hormones are just going haywire that it tends to make them feel suicidal, and several of them do. There's a condition called PMDD, which sort of renders them absolutely irrational during the time and can you know force them in that direction nobody really explores this in india and for a population like ours i have a feeling all these conditions medical conditions that we talk about probably a lot of women have it based on purely on our sheer population and that must be good enough reason for us to uh, invest money on a medical research understand why women go through this nothing of that sort happens whatsoever Prostitution is a huge issue in our country, and a lot of prostitutes are killed by men. You know, they, most of the prostitutes are uh, uh, poor, uneducated. They do this because they don't have a choice. I don't think sex workers work, never will. Um, pe women who do it will know and probably can vouch for it to say that, no, if I had, if I had something respectable to do, I would never do this. Like Rachel Moran says, if a woman's hungry, you put food in her mouth, not a dick. Um, but India, because of our population again, has a lot of these prostitutes and a lot of medical organizations along with some pimp uh, groups have had a, a sort of a tie up and they do medical experimentations on prostitutes. So they've been subjected to a series of uh, medical experiments, including um, giving them test drugs to combat AIDS. So these women are used as test subjects to see if something's working or not working. And then if the test is successful, they then market it as a product for AIDS prevention. And um, about 600 women were recruited in India, this was a while ago, to take a daily PrEP pill. It's a pre-exposure prophylaxis is what they call it. It's a, it's a medical drug, it's not very well researched. Nobody knows what happens to the body when someone consumes it. Uh, there's no due diligence done. They just randomly recruited these women. Who's gonna come um, on their behalf, right? Nobody's gonna come and say, no, no, why are you doing this? Nobody really cares about these women. So just randomly recruited 600 women, gave them this medication to see if uh, it, can, it can do something for global AIDS problem. Um, a few women that dropped out and it was because they were no longer prostituted or because of side effects and almost half of the women that were recruited 42 percent were illiterate so if you gave them a medication and say this is for your good they're just going to take it 
they're not going to find out what I can't pronounce it. Prophylaxis means they're not going to know it. They can't even read it. They can't. They, 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 and, and even if somebody were to give them that medication to say that, you know, this is good for you, you're in this job, you need to be careful, they'll blindly take it, believing those people, uh, you know, they're doing it for their good, because nobody ever, ever really does any good to these women, right? So they just blindly believe them. Another aspect of it is, um, there's, there's a film called Something Like a War. It was made by an Indian documentary filmmaker called Deepa Dhanraj. It explores the topic of uh, India's family planning program. It was a huge deal back in the day. There's a population explosion, so they came up with all kinds of programs. What they did was just basically um, mass eugenics. The men were absolutely unaffected by it. So just getting women in rural areas to the hospitals, doing painful procedures on them with no anesthesia. Okay, and I can't believe that there was a much simpler solution with men giving them a vasectomy, for example, was never even considered because you, you um, let this woman suffer, that's fine. But what if that man wants another child? If you give him a vasectomy, he's no longer a man. How can he not be man? You can't remove manhood from a man. Therefore. Um, Let's just recruit women and uh, make them go through with this procedure in a way that she will never recover from. She will never, never recover from it. Then the movie that I'm talking about, something like a war, actually has shots of women inside these really horrible clinics, family planning clinics. And the women are just there. Like they have no life in their eyes. They're just there. And there are these men who have no idea what they're doing, but there are some 10 different people with the woman's uh, legs spread uh, wide, and then there are just these people just looking and figuring out it out. And all along, the woman's quite awake. I can't even imagine it, but it happens in India. And men walked scot-free. And in, in the whole medical domain, surrogacy is again a problem. Now, a lot of gay rights activists would probably disagree with me who say that you know we we have access to we need access to you know having a family or having child or whatever but i disagree i don't think women owe anybody anything at all especially not her womb or you can't just rent a womb and just discard her like that you can't take the child away from the mother and pretend to be you know this this great gay couple who's going to take care of the surrogate child and uh, win all glory in front of the, in front of the world, that's, that's not okay. And a large majority of women who are surrogates come from India. And now there are some regulations that, you know, foreigners can't come to India and um, rent a womb, but I think it's just going to go underground and it already has. There are a lot of people just uh, do some sort of a side dealing where they claim to pay a little extra than how it was before. Um, at least when it was open, there were these clinics and she was taken care of because, not for the woman's sake, but for the child's sake because the child has to be delivered properly. The, ch the mother would still be lactating when the child is just taken away from her. Her hormones are going haywire, you know, they, she, she's uh, suffering from postpartum. Nobody cares. Women have killed themselves after the experience because they just couldn't bear the idea of not having that child. She wouldn't even have held her many, many times when she's still unconscious, the baby's gone. The woman wakes up confused and, and, and just, just, it's just heartbreaking to even think about. And like most things uh, in India, the liberals, they consider this to be not big an issue because the women are doing it out of their own choice, apparently. This whole choice model, which I don't subscribe to, is a huge problem in India. Um, the feminist movement in India itself is a very liberal feminist movement. It's not radical feminist where women are saying no to all forms of um, saying no to all forms of male violence against women in a way that it includes even prostitution and surrogacy and all these big, big domains that people usually don't want to touch. But Indian liberals want to say that if a woman becomes a surrogate, it gives her economic independence. See, several surrogate women even bought a house. Okay, has anybody found out how she's doing? You, got, you have a house, do you have your wife? 
Do you have that woman? Do you have that mother in your... Many of them happen to have their own children who they are ending up neglecting because they are in some center somewhere else far away from family because the center wants to look at you all the time to make sure that nothing happens, you don't do something stupid because the center is then answerable, right? To the, to the parents, whoever, the foreigners mostly. So they neglect their own children at the cost of, and you think just because she has a house, all of this is justified? I don't think so at all. Uh, the topic of uh, your discussion yesterday, pornography, is a huge problem in India as well. It's one of the largest consumers of pornography. And during COVID, something just so <laughs> grotesque happened where Pornhub made all their premium content free. So which means anybody with a cell phone and internet connection in less than three clicks can have access to hardcore pornography. And this could even be a child. And I can't even imagine a male child, say, if, I don't know, I can't even imagine an age anymore, but say four or five looks at something like that. And it sort of stays in his mind and he grows up and he looks at women from that vantage point only. And all the things that we talked about, it's just going to be like a generational issue over and over and over again, like a goddamn cycle, which will never end. Um, there are a lot of ways in which the Indian government tried to combat porn uh, situation by, you know, um, stopping access to a lot of these websites. But you know how uh, these nerds are. They have found a way to, you know, circumvent all of that. And there are all kinds of porn available anyway. One of the most, um, one of the most scary offshoots of this porn infiltration in India is that in the real world, a girl was raped and the media people released her name and released also the perpetrator's name. The next day in porn websites, her name was the top search. And so this just means that men are seeking titillation or pleasure when a woman is raped in real life. This is what they believe to be fun. You know, and when we called all the all of that out, it was dismissed as something not so important. Boys will be boys, men watch porn, get over it. Oh, even women watch porn, so what about that? You know, that sort of an argument, which basically amounts to nothing, and it's not productive at all. You say that it's a it's a dead end to that conversation. It is not going forward at all. We are not talking about okay. Men watch porn, uh, boys will be boys, some women watch porn. Can we put that aside and have a bit more of a conversation about the harms this is causing to women as well as men? Nobody's interested in that. There is, in fact, no anti-porn advocacy in India as far as I know at all. Men don't gather together and talk about the harms of pornography. Um, Men have, my, my friends have talked to me about how they don't no longer watch it or how they think it's bad, how they've come to realize it's bad and how it has affected the way they see women in the real world and things like that, who are non-users now. But there just never has been an impetus in men to get other men who feel like that or to decide to go to a school and talk about that, for example, like the session that you're gonna have later on. No such uh, advocacy whatsoever, and I think it's a male problem. That again falls uh, on the head of the feminist movement. Like, where are the feminists? Where are the feminists? Why are the young boys uh, watching pornography? Really? Where are the feminists? That's your question? There's a, there was a case in Delhi, a private school, really posh. A group of boys, underage, un when I say underage, I was teenage, um, in the lower teens, I think 13, 14, perhaps the ages were not very clear in the media article that came out, but really young, fairly young, had an Instagram, Instagram group thingy where they were all talking about how they will rape their classmates, their female classmates, what they would do to them. These are young boys and their only influence is pornography. In, in, you know, some of the leaked um, screenshots, you could see where they were getting their ideas from. And when this came out, um, Boys Locker Room, it was called, their group was called Boys Locker Room, that became a searched item on porn websites. 
And within a few days, there was already a group called Boys Locker Room 2.0 or something, and they continued to talk about this. Some school children were taken to be investigated or something like that, but you know how it is. Parents would just um, get them out. You can throw money at anything in India. You can just get get away with anything in India. And if it is minors, they are extra careful, obviously. That's another thing um, I wanted to mention here about the the criminalities of underage boys. Despite a proven criminal record, minors walk away with impunity. There's a section called Section 83 of the Indian Penal Code. It says, nothing is an offense which is done by a child above seven years of age and under 12 who has not attained sufficient maturity of understanding to judge the nature and consequences of his conduct on that occasion. But so many rapes are actually done by boys of this age. So what about that? How do we correct it? How do we, all right, you don't want to punish them. They probably don't know what they're doing or they don't understand the consequences, long-term consequences, but they really knew how to rape a girl. Where did they learn that from if they don't have a mental maturity or whatever it is that the section is describing? So the, the issue is so vast that I find it impossible for me to wrap my head around which area to address. So this is the thing about minors and uh, the Delhi school children would probably be under this age group. And even 13, 14 or whatever, if you are under 18, right, the age of major, ma majority, whatever is 18, if you are above 12, even then you're put in like a juvenile sort of a system where you can basically just walk scot-free. It, uh, it's really not a big deal. Rapists are re-assimilated into the society much sooner than victims who must face years of shame and character assassinations before they recover or heal, if they recover at all. And this is also another thing, a woman um, is subjected to rape and she dares to seek the criminal justice system's help in finding solution to the problem of punishing the perpetrator. Let's just say he's proven guilty or innocent, doesn't matter. The fact remains that she's raped and she has to come back into her society and in, into her neighborhood. Her life is never going to be the same. She's always going to be the girl that was raped. Everybody is going to hush hush about her. And I mean, as much as I hate marriage and things like that, the, her prospects, what the parents consider to be her future, um, she can't get married. So many of the families, you know what they do? They give away a very young girl to like a really old man as a second wife and things like that. Like, you know, they, they just try and find a way to get rid of this girl somehow because whatever has come her way right now, she should just take it because after all she was raped and she is not a commodity anybody wants. Um, and in the end, I just want to bring into light as if, <laughs> as if all these issues were not enough, right now India is also dealing with the whole transgender gender ideology issue which has put a huge spanner um, in conversations around male violence against women because we don't even apparently have access to the word woman anymore, right? How do you define male violence against women if male and female are fluid? Imagine the gravity of situation in a country like India based on the accounts of all these women that I've just talked about. Transgenderism couldn't possibly uh, come at a more worse time in India where we are already grappling with uh, an existing problem of misogyny uh, and male violence against women. Now, we are having to share spaces, we are having to give away our um, spots that are reserved for, say, in elections. There, there are these um, constituencies where only females can contest. Now, males are contesting, claiming to be female. It's, it's very hard to have constituencies that have female-only application many times. And usually, it's just the husband and the wife's just the dummy. They, they, they let the wife contest, but it's really the husband who's doing the politics. But even so, maybe there is a chance that she would do one small thing, say for girls' education or something like that. You know what this man did? He laid roads in his village. He laid roads and that's his priority. He won as a female. It wasn't even a general category where whatever he identifies as, it wasn't even general category, it was a female category. And the audacity of all these liberal feminists to support that and to encourage it 
it just really broke my heart. And right now, most of my advocacy is in combating gender identity ideology where young children, your girl children as young as say, 12, 13, are wearing best breast binders and several women, young women, are getting double mastectomies. Most of them could be homosexual. I wanted to be a boy when I was growing up. I can 100% imagine why every girl doesn't want to be a girl in a country like mine. So, yeah, it seems like a, like a really long road, but I want to end with uh, this one quote of Susan Brown Miller. The thing is, it's patriarchy that says men are stupid and monolithic and unchanging and incapable. It's patriarchy that says men have animalistic instincts and just can't stop themselves from harassing and assaulting. It's patriarchy that says men can only be attracted to certain qualities, can only have particular kind of responses, can only, have ex can only ha experience the world in narrow ways. Feminism holds that men are capable of more and are more than that. Thank you. Thank you.